Beast World, an event featuring the Titans and their battle against Beast Boy. But how? Dawn of DC has been building up to Waller trying to manipulate and control things. And Beast World is when we truly see her starting to take charge. This is Comic Story and Full Story, where I take videos from our main channel and combine them into a giant video for you to enjoy as a way to keep up with your favorite comic books. Today is Titan's Beast World. Let's get into it. Brother Eternity stands before the people of Earth, broadcasting to every electric device, promising that the next step in humanity's history has arrived. Across the solar system, the Forever Knots have touched down on the moon of Titan. It's there that they begin the mission of colonizing it for mankind, but the Forever Knots are shocked to discover a structure on Titan. It looks like a temple, one of the Forever Knots says over the radio. Brother Eternity tells them to continue forward, that they will be protected by their faith. As the Forever Knots venture inside, they discover strange writing on the walls. Brother Eternity commands them to broadcast his signal to the moon. Then he begins to speak in a strange language. Meanwhile, at Titan's Tower, the Titans watch this historic broadcast, but Starfire jumps to her feet as she recognizes the words. Those words! He's speaking the language of my ancestors! He's speaking the ancient Tamaranian! She says in shock. Nightwing quickly gets on the radio asking Oracle for Brother Eternity's location while he orders the rest of the team to prepare to move. Meanwhile, back on Titan, the surface of the moon begins to shake. The Forever Knots rush out of the temple trying to get back to their ship, shouting for Brother Eternity's help. And on Earth, the man smiles. That is not my name. Back at the tower, Nightwing orders his team to move. Cyborg opens up a boom tube to the moon and he, Starfire, and Donna Troy and Raven move through it. In moments, the powerful heroes are headed down to the surface of Titan, where they discover the Forever Knots have been frozen to death. Cyborg takes a quick scan of the surface. Gravitational waves are much stronger on the surface. Rhythmic. He reports to the team. It's Raven who reaches out with her powers, sensing another mind on Titan. She suddenly pauses, her eyes opening with fear as she realizes the truth. It's a heartbeat, she shouts, and the surface begins to split open beneath their feet as the heroes leap into the sky, heading into space. As they reach for the safety of the void, Starfire turns around, realizing what has happened. I know what this is. It's not a moon, it's a prison for a god, she whispers. Far below them, the moon of Titan explodes outward, revealing massive tentacles of a space creature. It's gaping, tooth-lined maw reaching outward. We must go, Starfire says to her friends. What? We can't just leave this thing here, Donna shouts, but Starfire explains that the creature is an ancient god who can take control of their bodies. It cannot be allowed to seize our power, she says, so Cyborg prepares a bomb back on Earth, and Starfire shakes her head. No, first we need the Tamaranian archives, she says, and an hour later, Starfire is standing before a gathering of Earth's heroes and Titan Tower. She explains to them that the creature is known as the Necrostar. 30 million years ago, her people tried to stand against the Conqueror, but they failed. It took the might of Starro to finally weaken the Necrostar, and for her people to be able to freeze it into a prison and send it out into the cosmos. Superman looks up with his vision, peering into space. I see it. The Necrostar has passed Jupiter. It's like an hour away at most, he warns. Batman leaps into command mode, ordering the heroes to do what they can to slow the creature down while the rest of them search for Starro. But Beast Boy steps up, and he tells the Dark Knight that he kind of has an idea. Batman folds his arms as he looks at the young hero. You kind of do? You're gonna have to do a lot better than that. Batman begins, but Raven steps forward to help her boyfriend. It would be a shame to lose our whole planet because of your negativity, Batman. I know Gar's mind. The plan requires sacrifice, but it is sound. He doesn't need to be spoken to like a child. He's not one of your Robins. Batman pauses for a moment before turning to Nightwing. This is your call. This is your team. But Nightwing doesn't even hesitate. I trust my team completely. What do you need, Gar? Beast Boy pauses, and he nods his head. I need the ocean. I need Cyborg. And I need all of you to buy me some time. So later, the heroes of Earth are launching into space, preparing to give their friend the time that he needs. But the Necrostar has already launched his spores at the Earth, meaning those that can't go into space have to fight against the small creatures that are trying to take over everybody. 
Cyborg, Beast Boy, we're running out of time, Flash says as he dashes around, trying to rip spores out of the air. But over in the ocean, Gar has begun his plan. He knows that they can't find Starro in time, but they still need the Space Conqueror. While Cyborg flies next to him, he swims through the ocean in whale form, and Raven is also there. I can feel your fear, Beast Boy. Are you sure about this? Raven asks him. It's not like we have any other choice. Move back, he tells her, and she nods. I will move away, but I will still be with you. And with that, Beast Boy begins his transformation. Raven then appears in his mind, helping him through the pain, calming his fear, and in his mind, she holds him close. Do not think of the pain, yours or mine. Concentrate on what you must do. We will hold each other together, she says. Out in space, our heroes continue their fight, hitting the Necro Star with everything that they have. But as Shazam tries to fling magical lightning at the beast, one of the spores dives into his mouth. He is overtaken and begins to lash out at Wonder Woman. The Necro Star has control of Shazam, Donna warns the group, but suddenly there's a voice in her mind. Let me see what I can do about that. Gar says as a small green starro floats past her. It flies into Shazam's mouth, ripping the necrospore free. Yeah, I think I got this, the little Gar says as it rips the spore apart, and the heroes look down in wonder at the massive green starro that was once Beast Boy floating in space to challenge the necrostar. Hey, necrostar, get your ancient evil ass away from my planet, Garo shouts. He locks into combat with the massive monster but his small Garos drop on Earth fighting against the spores, freeing the people that are being controlled and tearing them apart. Back out in space, Garo pushes the Necrostar clear of the Earth, allowing Cyborg to open up the boom tube. Just put it in our path, I'll do the rest, Garo mentally tells his friend. The boom tube is opened up and Garo pushes Necrostar inside. Necrostar, say hello to the Boomerang Nebula, the coldest place in the known universe. Garo says, as the cold hits the Necro Star quickly, it begins to freeze its tentacles. Garo manages to push himself away as the boom tube is closing, but it ends up cutting off one of his arms. Gar, what is it? Cyborg asks him, sensing his friend's pain. I just lost an arm in the boom tube. Don't worry, I still have four other ones. I'm pretty sure I can regrow that one. But we might have to do a high four instead of a high five. He then points out that Cyborg should still feel bad about it. But suddenly, Cyborg has gone quiet. Cyborg? Garo asks, reaching out with his mind. He turns his massive eye towards his friend and sees a dark figure floating there, inky darkness swirling around him. Cyborg floating behind him, now unconscious. Cyborg is sleeping. Garfield Logan, I am Dr. Hate, the awfully named Dr. Hate says as an introduction. The new villain then removes his helmet, revealing his face to Gar. You? How? Gar says in shock, but Hate explains that it doesn't matter, and he holds up his arms, dark magic swirling around him, reaching out for Gar. I'm curious. Why do you fight for humanity? What did you want from them? Hate asks, but Gar tells him that he merely wanted them to be better. But his mind is already disappearing. Please, I don't want to go. Gar whispers in his mind as he retreats, and Garo takes over. Dr. Hate's eyes glow. Amanda Waller says thank you, Garfield Logan. Back on Earth, Raven looks up in shock. I can't feel Gar's mind anymore, she tells the others. But Batman looks up as a shadow falls over Earth. He's there, Batman shouts, and Raven shakes her head as a massive Garo descends upon Earth. No, he's not there, she says, knowing that all that remains of Gar's mind is the beast. The spores rain upon the Earth, taking control of everyone that they can, and they begin to get transformed into beasts. And over at Kondok, Black Adam tries to fight against the transformation, but the magical lightning cracks into the ground as he roars in a mindless rage. Floating in deep space, Cyborg's vision finally reboots. He opens his eyes to find Raven floating next to him. You're all right. I have you, she says softly as she reaches out for him. She asks if he remembers anything about what happened, and Cyborg discovers that his backup memory is blank from the last half hour. Where's Gar? Vic asks. Raven opens up a portal leading him back to Earth, where Vic is shocked to find the heroes fighting a massive Garro and its spores attacking the planet. Gar, are you in there? Raven calls out through her link, but there's no answer. Back on Earth, Animal Man is in shock as his link with the Animal Kingdom is suddenly bursting with new energy. 
but over in Bloodhaven, Batman and Nightwing are doing their best to defend the civilians from the animal rampage as people are overtaken by the spores. The two heroes pull people to safety, but one man is shouting that his son, Connor, was left behind in the car. I'll get him, Batman growls as he leaps back into the fight. Down on the bridge below, the young boy screams as a bear man stomps in front of the car, roaring in anger, but Batman kicks the beast in the head, smashing the front windshield. Connor, move back from the windshield, Batman shouts, smashing through the remaining glass, grabbing the boy. But more beasts come in as Batman fires his grappling hook. Before he could pull them to freedom, the beasts overwhelm them and drive Batman into the ground, blood seeping from his wounds. Batman slides the grappling gun to Connor. It's okay, just hold on to this tightly and don't let go. Batman gasps to the boy as claws and teeth rip into him. Don't be afraid. Your dad sent me and Nightwing is up there. He'll catch you. It's what he does. Batman says as he hits the button and the boy is pulled to freedom. Nightwing swings down on his own line, grabbing the boy, pulling him to his father. But Nightwing doesn't hesitate, leaping back down to save Batman, knocking the beast aside with kicks and his shock of scrimmers. On a scale of one to Bane, how broken are you? He asks as he knocks aside another monster. Batman shrugs off the concern, even though Nightwing points out that he can see one of Batman's bones. The two finally manage to leap to the safety of the rooftops, looking over the destruction and chaos of the city. It was my call, Nightwing whispers in despair. But Batman points out that it was a good call at the time, and at least they still have a planet left to defend. What's next? Batman asks, forcing Nightwing to calm himself and think about the problem. Safe havens and quarantined. We examine the beast people, learn everything that we can, work on how to undo this. But at that moment, there's a hiss behind them and the two heroes turn as a snake woman steps from the building stairwell. She launches forward, her mouth opening wide as Venom spits out of her fangs. Batman grabs a hold of her jaws, holding them steady. Knockout gas, right pocket! He snaps to Nightwing, but before the young hero can react, the spores leap from the snake woman's mouth and into Batman's! Batman stumbles away as the woman returns to her human form. He then gasps, beginning to transform as he looks up at Nightwing. Bruce, I'll bring you back. I'll bring everyone back, Nightwing tells his father. But as Bruce is beginning to transform, he begins to become a wolf man. As his eyes go from human to beast, he looks pleadingly at Nightwing. Dick, please, don't let me hurt anyone! He gasps, and the transformation is complete as he roars into the night. Back at Titan's Tower, Barbara Gordon is acting as Oracle, trying to coordinate the hero's efforts. Her satellites look at Kondok when she sees a transformed Black Adam slaughtering his own people. I need heavy hitters in Kondok now! She shouts over the comms. Donna Troy and Starfire rocket towards the city, slamming into Black Adam. Starfire stuns him with an energy blast while Donna flies in, rocking him with a punch. It hits him so hard the buildings around them quake. But back in Bloodhaven, Nightwing is trying to defend himself from Bruce's attacks while asking Oracle for some backup. He seems to have all the same abilities without any restraint. Nightwing shouts as he blocks another blow, a slash coming at him across the ribs and Nightwing stumbles. Listen, we gotta warn everyone now. The spores seem to be moving to stronger hosts. We need to warn every superpowered hero before they make the problem even worse. Back over at Kondok, Starfire and Donna are doing their best to hold off Black Adam, but Oracle warns them of the possibility of spores attacking. The two heroes look down as the spores begin to jump out of the mouths of the Kondok civilians and charge towards them. Whatever you do, don't get infected, or you could become the biggest problem that we have. Oracle shouts at them. But back in Washington, D.C., Amanda Waller's helicopter flies over the city, and she looks down to see the battle between the National Guard and the Beast People. She looks across at Dr. Hate. This is more than I was expecting, she notes, and he shrugs. If you wanted a more controlled global threat, you should have asked somebody else. Because I'm working with the Lords of Chaos here, Waller. The helicopter touches down at the White House, and Waller orders Hate to stay in the vehicle. She and Peacemaker will go inside for their meeting with the President, asking him for the authority to take care of the situation. Waller, I'm not activating the Bureau of Sovereignty. The power you're requesting, the President begins to state, pointing out that Superman and the heroes can deal with this issue. I know how you feel about Superman and his team, but we're not dealing with the Justice League. They have stepped aside. I can save the world, I just need the authority to do so. She says, looking at the president, do you really want the planet in the hands of a group of 20-somethings? Do you really want all life on Earth dependent on Titans and Nightwing? Back in Bloodhaven, Nightwing breaks the surface of the bay, gasping for air. He struggles up one arm, clutching the wound on his side as blood is seeping out. 
Is anyone else close? Can anyone reach me? He gasps over the comms. Nightwing, are you okay? What do you need? Barbara responds, and Nightwing pulls himself onto the shore, dropping the unconscious body of Wolf Batman down. I need a doctor, I need scientists, and I need a cage. The story then moves into Beast World Gotham, but we're only going to be covering the first story in here as it does continue what is going on. Nightwing looks down at Bruce. I've got Batman subdued, but I'm not sure for how long, Nightwing continues. But at that moment, Bruce's eyes snap open and he leaps up, growling at Nightwing before slashing at him. Bruce snarls, rushing away into the night. Oracle, I need backup! Batman's free! Nightwing shouts over the comms, but Oracle informs him that the other heroes are dealing with the beasts across the world. Nightwing acknowledges and follows after Bruce, informing Oracle that he's most likely going to the only place that makes sense to him on a primal level. But back in Gotham City, the beasts are attacking people on the streets, and Waylon Jones comes around the corner. Who do you think you are? Bargain in on Killer Croc's entire deal? Croc snaps as he rushes out, punching a polar bear person in the face. The bear then leaps at him. I ain't scared of no animal people, because this town's only big enough for one of me. Croc says as he meets the new threat, throwing the monster to the ground, but the spore and the beast can sense that Croc is stronger, leaping out of that person's mouth and down Waylon's throat. Meanwhile, looters have begun to take advantage of the chaos, smashing in windows and stealing things. But there is something in the shadows, and the Bat Wolf continues to protect his city on a primal level. Nightwing steers through the cluttered streets on his motorcycle, informing Oracle that he thinks he's closing in on Batman. But as he rounds a corner, he sees a massive crocodile beast tearing up the city. Did you find him? Oracle asks over the comms as Nightwing screeches to a stop. Not yet. First, I gotta drain a swamp, he says, and he revs the bike, roaring towards Croc, finally leaping off of it and sending it flying at the monster. But Croc turns, smacking the machine aside. Oracle, I'm gonna need, like, Starfire on this. Well, she's fighting Black Adam right now, Barbara informs him, and Nightwing sighs, leaping into the fight, smacking the monster with his shock sticks. Wait, is that you, Waylon? Did you transform into an actual Croc? Or are you an alligator? I still don't know the difference. Nightwing jokes. But Waylon knocks him aside, sending him flying into a car. As Croc moves in for the killing blow, a shadow falls over him. Gotham still has its protector. Wolf Batman leaps out of the night, slashing Croc across the face, knocking him away. Nightwing struggles to his feet, looking at his beast mentor. You still in there, Batman? The wolf looks at him, growling low, bringing a smile to Dick's face. Good enough for me. The two work together once again, leaping at Croc. Batman slashing the monster as Nightwing knocks him across the face, sending him into a nearby department store. Nightwing slips inside, finding Wolf Batman standing over the unconscious Croc, his claws at the monster's throat. But Dick holds up his hands. Okay, I don't care if you've turned into a dog or an alien or anything, you're still Batman and Batman doesn't kill. The wolf stares at him for a moment before growling and rushing forward. Nightwing turns, leading Bruce on a chase through the store, and Bruce follows his nose, chasing Nightwing into the back room. But Nightwing leaps out of the shadows, using the store's power cords to shock Bruce and knock him unconscious. Shortly after, Nightwing gets back on the radio to Oracle. Dragged him to the Gotham Zoo and got what we needed to hold him, Nightwing tells her as he looks at the wolf in the cage. You think that'll hold him? We can't lose Batman in all of this madness, Barbara says, and Dick nods and smiles. Yeah, I think he'll be fine. No matter how feral Bruce gets at his heart, he's still a good boy. Lion Black Adam roars, trying to slash at Donna Troy while Starfire continues to burn the Garo spores around them. Get out of there, Oracle shouts over the radio, but Donna shakes her head. If we retreat, Black Adam will kill everyone in the city, she shouts, but Starfire has an idea and she grabs a hold of Donna, pulling her in close. She sends out a blast of fire energy, burning all of the spores around them. Below them, Flash and Impulse have now arrived, Impulse holding up a hand as the spores fall around them. Hey, it's raining burning horrors, he says with a smile. Starfire and Donna then land next to the Flash, explaining that they've come to evacuate the uninfected from Kondok. As the speedsters begin their work, Raven's voice appears in their minds. Donna, I need you in space. Raven tells her, so Starfire nods to her friend and turns back to Lion Black Adam. Go, I'll deal with Adam, she says. Meanwhile, back at Titan's Tower, Nightwing has brought the wolf Batman to the tower and caged him up. He's tired, and he's wounded. He's bleeding from several cuts from Batman's claws. Oracle looks at him and orders him to allow Dr. Clancy to check his wounds. The longtime friend of Dick Grayson asks him to remove his mask. 
She wants to check if he has a concussion, but of course Dick Grayson refuses. Dick, it's okay, Clancy says, revealing that she has actually known that Dick Grayson was Nightwing for some time. Dick is shocked, but they're interrupted by the arrival of Detective Chimp. Clancy screams in fear at the talking animal throwing her flashlight at him. Bobo steps aside and raises an eyebrow. You think I'm one of the beast people? I get that not everyone has my powers of deduction, but I'm talking and I'm wearing a little hat. He says, taking off his detective's hat. Nightwing smiles and introduces Bobo to Clancy. He's the world's greatest detective and apparently also pretty good at infiltrating impregnable force fields. As Nightwing tells her, amazed that Bobo slipped through the Titan's tower's defenses. Bobo nods and turns to Nightwing. He explains that he has realized that while this attack looks like pure chaos, it is in fact not. The creatures have an agenda, Bobo tells him. Meanwhile, back over in Metropolis, a commercial plane is asking for permission to land, but the pilots are shot as bird people begin to rip the plane apart, taking out the engines and beginning to tear into the main cabin. We're going down! The pilots shout over the radio, and with a lurch, the plane suddenly stops falling out of the sky as the pilots look out of the window, surprised to find Power Girl holding them up. It's okay, I've got you, she says with a smile. But one of the bird people's spores sense a powerful being. It leaps from the infected person's mouth and into Power Girl. She manages to put the plane on the ground, but staggers away. Oracle, code red, I'm infected please hurry she says over the radio as she begins to transform suddenly she bellows in anger and pain as she transforms into a literal flaming bird the power girl phoenix leaps into the air turning her rage filled gaze on the plane that she just saved a blast of heat vision lashes out but it's stopped by a chest sporting the s shield of superman john kent smiles as he turns back to the civilians in the planes everyone all right he asks. He looks at the flight attendants and asks them to calmly get everyone to safety, promising that he's going to deal with Power Girl. Electricity suddenly crackles around him as he transforms with his new powers to Blue Superman. He leaps into the air, grabbing Power Girl, flying her away with a crack of the sound barrier. Meanwhile, back in Kondok. Starfire has managed to fight Lion and Black Adam off. She slams him into the ground and the beast flies away in fear. Oracle, Black Adam, he just ran away. She says into the radio in surprise. Back at the tower, Bobo nods his head, explaining that the beast people have basic instincts, fight or flight. And faced with a super strong burning woman? Yeah, he's chosen flight. Barbara says in agreement. But Bobo points out that the infected are attacking infrastructure as well. And that goal isn't coming from instinct. The drive is coming from something else, Bobo explains. Meanwhile, Donna has arrived in space. She has the rest of the heroes here trying to slow down Garo's approach to Earth. The mighty being is just trying to get to Earth, to approach it and swallow it or something. Raven goes up to Donna, asking if she can use her lasso of persuasion to slow Garo down. If it's stronger than I am, the power will be reversed. I will be lost. Donna explains to Raven, but the magic user nods her head. If you are lost, I will find you. Could you please try? Raven asks her softly. Donna nods her head, taking up her lasso. She orders the other heroes to return to Earth. She flies to the massive creature that was once her friend, the creature that her friend has become, Garo, and loops her lasso around one of its tentacles. Hear me! No further! She shouts to the conqueror. Sweat breaks out on her face as strain begins to hit her. But Garo, he stops for now. Donna looks back to Raven. I can hold him. Not for long, but for now. Go, help below. Stop the beast. Donna gasps as she holds her friend Garo in space. Meanwhile, over at Stryker's Island, Amanda Waller has arrived with her protection of Peacemaker and her paramilitary forces. It's here that they are fighting off infected shark people that have boarded onto Stryker's Island and have begun to approach her. Waller begins to head inside to find one prisoner that she's looking for, telling Peacemaker to simply deal with the shark people. They're just sharks. She stands outside of the prisoner's cell, glaring at the bald villain. Lex Luthor, you're coming with me. 
she says. He smiles, looking up from his book. I'm sorry, Amanda. I'm afraid I will have a hard time because of my many, many crimes. You see, I'm paying penance for the things that I've done. Get up, or I'm putting a bullet in the brain you think so highly of, she tells him. He finally stands, and he asks her, What do you want, Waller? I doubt you'd risk my head. Clearly you want help with your giant starfish problem. He tells her, and Waller shakes her head, explaining that this isn't Lex's mind that she needs, but it's something that he stole from Batman. It's time to slay Beast Boy, she says as they turn to leave. Years ago on the planet Tamarin, Cory stands with her mother looking out over the sunset on their city. But her mother doesn't have much time for admiring beauty and must leave for a council meeting. Xander, one of her aides, offers to take Cory to play with her sister. Should I not join mother and father in the council chambers? Cory asks Xander, and he shakes his head, smiling, telling her not to be so eager to debate taxes at such a young age. As they walk to join Commander, they're all shocked to find an invasion of their planet beginning. The Citadel, acting under the orders of the Dominators, have invaded Tamarin. Cory was captured and enslaved, experimented on, but eventually she rose up and defeated her captors. She freed her people. Now she is the hero Starfire on the planet Earth. And now she's fighting against the Lion Black Adam. She will not allow another planet to be overrun. Back at Titan's Tower, Nightwing and Oracle are watching over the whole situation, sending heroes where they need to be as the spores invade the Earth and transform all of those that they infect. Barbara looks over her shoulder at Dick. This isn't sustainable. All we're doing is reacting. We're gonna be overrun soon. Dick nods, explaining to her that he thinks that he has the beginning of a plan. Hopefully, Dr. Clancy and Bobo can find a medical solution before it comes to that, he says. But down in the tower's med station, Dr. Clancy and Bobo don't have great news. There is no infection as far as they can tell. It's the spores themselves that are actually transforming the people. Meaning the only way to bring back the infected is to draw out the organism inside of them, Nightwing says when he joins them. But their conversation is cut short when the Titan's computer identifies someone at the gate. Outside, Tempest has arrived from Brother Eternity. The Titan's computer briefly shuts down the tower's defenses to let the old Titan member back inside, but Brother Eternity and Tempest watch as they enter, and the rest of the Beast people then rush inside as well. The Necrostar has been taken, but we will undo this. We will cut the Titans down to size, and we will bring back the Conqueror. Brother Eternity says to Tempest as they enter the tower behind the horde of beasts. Back in the med bay, Oracle comes on the comms and warns Nightwing about the incoming horde. Nightwing rushes Dr. Clancy, her kids, and Bobo to a safe room in the basement. It's ready to take three Omega Beam blasts from Darkseid, Nightwing tells him, and Bobo looks at him with a raised eyebrow. You're not gonna join us? But Nightwing shakes his head, a look of determination on his face. No, I'm gonna get my friend back, he says, and Barbara begins to tap away at a few keys on her computer, putting out the word to the rest of the Titans, warning them of Tempest's arrival, asking for aid when they can pull themselves from their tasks. With this done, she joins in Nightwing as they begin to move through Titan's tower. Last chance to head to the safe room, he tells her as they both pull out their blunt weapons, but she shakes her head as they launch into a fight with the horde of beasts. Better to have two people out here who know your plan for dealing with Tempest. The world has a better chance if he's on our side. She says that she whirls around knocking a rabbit person away with her staff as she kicks a snake person. Meanwhile, Tempest and Brother Eternity arrive at the medical bay and find Wolf Batman growling from his cage. Brother Eternity motions to Tempest to leave him. Find your friends, Tempest. End them all except the ones that I need. Eternity orders, turning back to Batman who is continuing to growl. But Eternity only smiles. Growl all you want, Batman. I'm still going to kill all of your young heroes once they've helped me. Deeper in the tower, Nightwing and Batgirl continue their fight, but stop as water rushes into the hallways, knocking them and the beasts to their feet as it begins to fill it up. He's here, Nightwing says as he breaks from the water. Beneath them, Tempest begins to spiral upward. Keep your head above water. We have to lead him to the corridor, B. Nightwing shouts to Batgirl as they both tread water, but Batgirl's eyes widen as she sees a green spore drop from the vents above. Nightwing tries to turn quickly, but the creature leaps into his mouth. Stick to the plan! He gasps at Barbara as he begins to transform before her eyes. Meanwhile, Starfire arrives at the entrance of the tower, asking Oracle where she's needed, but there's no response. More of the spores, sensing Starfire's power, leap at her, but she easily burns them out of the air. Oracle, 
Nightwing, can anyone hear me? Corey says over the comms. She looks up as someone steps from the shadows. I can hear you. Brother Eternity says with a smile. And Starfire rushes at him, grabbing him by the throat, slamming him against the wall. You! How did you know about the Necrostar? What did you hope to accomplish by releasing it? She demands. Meanwhile, outside, the sound of a boom tube opening echoes throughout the halls. Eternity smiles, looking down at Corey. Cyborg must be here. Finally. Green energy begins to erupt around him, throwing Corey back, and she looks up in shock as Eternity's disguise burns away, revealing someone from her past. If I had known how much trouble you'd prove to be, I would have just killed you rather than enslaved you, Coriander. Xander says to her as he glances down at her, her eyes widening as she recognizes the man from her past and he raises his glowing fists at her. You're going to give my god back, princess. Deeper in the tower, a boom tube opens up and Cyborg and Raven step inside to find the halls flooded. It's Tempest. I can feel him. She turns, walking away. I'll face Garth. You find Brother Eternity. She says as she disappears into the darkness. Meanwhile, at the entrance hall, Xander hits Starfire with another blast of energy that sends her into the wall. She gasps as she looks up at him. Xander, you were our friend. You served my family, she gasps. But Xander shakes his head, telling Cory that her family stood in the way of the return of his god. They had to be removed, he shouts, blasting her again, detailing his plan. How he betrayed the royal family and in return, the Dominators gifted him with one of the last pieces of their god and told him where the Necrostar was imprisoned. They opened the portal to this planet and a world once too cold for the Necrostar, but one that I could prepare for its rebirth. But Cyborg is suddenly behind him, a massive arm cannon pointed at the alien's head. We get it. You're an absolute shit. Cyborg says and fires, the blast knocking Xander across the room. Cyborg rushes to Starfire's side. He's not here for me, she gasps, and Cyborg turns just in time for one of the microspores to leap down his throat. She was trying to say I'm here for you, Cyborg, Xander says with a smile. Down on the flooded tunnels, Batgirl continues to fight, warning any titans that are listening that the tower has been overrun. I'm here! Where do you and Nightwing need me? Flash says as he dashes in front of the door. But Batgirl informs them that Nightwing is infected. The hero now transformed into a fox leaps out of the shadows at Barbara. I'm sorry, she says as she whirls around hitting him with her staff. Dick, can you hear me? Batgirl asks, trying to reason with her love. But Tempest appears behind the fox. No, he cannot hear you. Goodbye. He says as he raises his hand, preparing to hit Batgirl with an energy blast. But Raven is there throwing up a shield just as the blast is about to hit Batgirl. Good timing. Batgirl says as a thanks to her friend, and in a blur of red lightning, Wally is standing next to them. Nightwing is a fox! Of course he is! Wally notes, and Raven links their minds, and Batgirl quickly fills them in on the plan. Flash, get Barbara to Corridor B. I'll meet you there, Raven says with a nod, and Wally doesn't hesitate, grabbing Barbara and running through the water. See you soon, he calls over his shoulder, with Raven stalking forward towards Garth. Your magic is strong, Tempest, but the thing controlling you lacks imagination. Raven says as she swats aside one of Tempest's magical blasts. She reaches out her hands. Let's get rid of it. She says, grabbing Tempest and pulling him through the portal to Corridor B, where Oracle and Flash are already waiting in the control room and they seal it. What's about to happen? Raven asks as she shields herself. The fastest way Nightwing could think of to take down an Atlantean is flash dehydration. Batgirl says as she activates the corridor, massive heat lamps begin to glow and Tempest falls to the ground as the moisture is sucked out of his body. The spore tries to leap to freedom, but Raven destroys it with a simple magical blast. Back at the entrance, Xander is looking at Cyborg, ordering him to bring back the Necrostar, but Cyborg gets to his feet with a look of disgust on his face. This is gross. I can feel it wiggling around. Xander is shocked by his reaction. All have fallen at the spore's control. You will bring back my god, Machine Man. He snaps, but Cyborg smiles, pointing out that he's part human and part alien technology. I'm missing half the things the spore's trying to latch onto. He says, before spitting the spore out and when it hits the ground, Starfire stomps on its head before whirling around and punching Xander. Moments later, the Titans have finally gathered, with Flash explaining that he locked the beast in the tower's basement. They all look at Foxwing and Wally smiles. This guy was never going to turn into a cockroach, was he? Starfire steps forward and asks Cyborg to release Nightwing from his bubble shield. 
I can free him, she says. Foxwing leaps at her, and she grabs him, pushing him against the wall. Sensing a stronger host, the Spora leaps out of Nightwing's mouth, and Starfire lets it get close before taking a bite out of it and spitting it on the floor. I will not be enslaved again, she says as she wipes her mouth. Nightwing transforms back, and Cory lowers him to the ground. You're okay, she tells him, and Nightwing nods, asking about Tempest as Barbara gives him some support. Hey, Tempest says as he enters the room, drinking a glass of water. Somebody's flash dehydrated me. He looks at the others and asks about Brother Eternity. He's with Raven. She said she wanted a word. Nearby, Raven is staring down at Xander. You started all this. You hurt Cory. You enslaved Garth. And because of you, Gar is gone. Xander smiles up at her. You don't scare me, witch. I'm far stronger than you think I am, he says, and she shakes her head. No, you're not. You just latched onto something cruel to make yourself feel stronger. She says as she raises her hand. Xander screams as he disappears before her eyes. She returns to the Titans and informs them that Brother Eternity will no longer be of any trouble. He's in the Phantom Zone. The others look shocked, but she shakes her head and turns away from them. Do not concern yourself with the ethics of this. We have a world to save from the damage he's done. Chester Runk runs away from both a tiger and a frogman. But a truck screeches to a stop as Peacemaker jumps out, raising his massive pistol, firing twice, killing the beast. Chester Runk, I'm Peacemaker. You're gonna be okay. Peacemaker says with a smile, but Runk is staring back at the monsters with shock in his eyes. That, that, that was my son! He gasps. Peacemaker suddenly looks surprised, admitting that he didn't know or even think about it. My bad. He says, but Runk stands tall, stalking towards him, energy beginning to swirl out of his chest. Whoa, Chester, we know what you can do. Just be cool, Peacemaker says as he backs up. The energy is gathering quickly, though, so Peacemaker reaches behind his back, drawing out a trank gun, shooting Chester in the neck, dropping him to the ground. I saved you, man, and you're going to suck me into oblivion? I feel sorry for you, but now I'm kind of glad Waller has such messed up plans for you. Peacemaker gripes as he drags Chester to the back of his truck. Meanwhile, in Ivy Town, the monsters are attacking as the police try to evacuate everyone. A lone woman steps forward. Look what's coming! One of the cops tries to tell her, but she shakes her head and begins to grow massive. I can see them, gigantic growls, as she becomes huge, mashing the monsters with her fist. Not so scary, though. She grunts. The parasites from within the beast leap out, though. They jump down her throat, quickly transforming her into one of Beast Boy's army. The people watch in terror as the massive woman suddenly becomes a massive bear that begins to rampage around the city. Back at the tower, Oracle alerts the heroes to the city-level threat. The green will offer aid. Swamp Thing answers over the comms, while the rest of the titans leap into the boom tube. But John is already on the scene. He looks over the massive damage that the Giganta Bear has caused. Great row, he whispers. The boom tube opens quickly and the Titans arrive, with Nightwing taking in the damage at a glance and beginning to issue orders. Flash, evacuate every damaged building and the surrounding areas. Swamp Thing, the buildings are coming down. We need you to reinforce them, Nightwing shouts. And he turns to Vic as the heroes get to work and he asks if he can boom tube Giganta somewhere safe. But Vic shakes his head. Not with the precision that we need. She's too big and too embedded in the town and environment. We could lose the buildings or the people opening up a boom tube that size. Nightwing nods, asking Starfire and Superman to move Giganta out of the city. Starfire nods her head. It's like moving a mountain. So let's go move a mountain. She says as she and Superman fly forward. But Giganta is rampaging. She backhand swipes John away. He careens through the city, smashing straight into the buildings, destroying everything in his sight. He leaps to his feet, hoping that he did not kill anyone by accident. But the Flash is there. John, it's okay, kid. I saw you coming. I got everyone out of the way. Wally tells him as he helps the young Superman to his feet. John is shocked by the level of death and destruction around them, but Wally is there, helping him process it. He puts a hand on the young man's shoulder. I know it's a lot, but you can slow it down. Process it. Breathe. And then we get back to work. He tells him. John nods as electrical energy cracks around him as he leaps into the sky. In moments, he and Starfire have lifted the massive bear high above the city. Cyborg, Starfire, and Superman have taken Giganta far away. 
The streets below her are wide and clear. Nightwing says over the comms as she grabs a child and knocks the ape person that was attacking her away. Cyborg acknowledges it, flying to Giganta, opening up a boom tube beneath her, allowing Starfire and Superman to drop the bear within it. Giganta then goes through the tube, slamming into a stadium five miles away. Superman quickly flies to the woman, frying the spores that are coming out. With the main danger averted, the heroes quickly finish evacuating Ivy Town, and they return to Titan's Tower. But at the tower, Oracle shows them a live news feed where the head of the Bureau of Sovereignty does a press conference. Having been recently activated by the President of the United States, the Bureau is promising to end the threat of Beast Boy and orders the Titans to stop protecting their friend and instead stop this reign of terror that has swept across the planet. The Titans' cowardice and compassion could lead to the extinction of the human race. We cannot allow this. The head of the Bureau shouts. Cyborg looks to Nightwing. They're going to take him out. But Nightwing shakes his head, a grim look on his face. No, they're not. He says, looking to his team, asking Oracle if she can get any available heroes into space to protect Beast Boy, as long as Donna still has him under her control with her lasso. Until we know there's no hope for him, I won't give up on Gar. We will protect the world from Beast Boy and protect Beast Boy from the world, Nightwing tells his team. Meanwhile, over at Stryker's Island, Amanda Waller has brought Lex Luthor deep under the prison, where the former villain has a teleporter hidden away. But Lex points out that for his teleporter to be accurate, he'll need a second one on the other end. Without a dedicated exit, the accuracy of the teleportation will be out by miles. He explains and Waller shrugs. Beast Boy is currently six of Switzerland. Can the great Lex Luthor not just aim for the middle? She motions back to Chester as Peacemaker wheels him in, explaining that Runk is what he is sending. I'm not comfortable with this. I've changed. I'm in the hero business now. Lex tells her. And Waller just glares at him. I've heard. And I'm asking you to help save the world, Luther. Meanwhile, Raven is heading into space to help save Beast Boy, but she is stomped by a powerful blast. She looks up to see Dr. Hate floating before her. Who are you? And what do you want? She asks. Chaos magic cracks in Dr. Hate's palms. I'm Dr. Hate. As for what I want, that's a complicated question. The Lords of Chaos have their own desires in this helm. But for now, daughter of Trigon, I'm just here to keep you distracted. In space, the heroes have gathered and they're watching for any threats against Garo. But they're unaware that Chester Runk has been teleported within Beast Boy within Garo. Runk has mere seconds to live in the vacuum of space, and as he begins to panic, his powers, they begin to activate. Runk is capable of creating black holes, which Amanda Waller is confident will kill Garo and blink out of existence when Runk dies. Far below, the world can sense the death screams of Beast Boy far above their heads. Raven turns in shock, sensing her love in pain and Dr. Hate waves her away. It's done. You can go. Say your goodbyes. Raven flies forward. She screams Gar's name. Seconds later, Chester Runk and what was left of Beast Boy die together. The heroes watch as the lifeless husk of Garo floats through the vastness of space, saddened by the loss of one of their own, even if he had threatened the planet. Donna Troy floats up behind Raven, offering her condolences. There was someone here, someone with the Helm of Chaos. They may be behind all of this, Raven says softly, but she looks up, her eyes glowing with anger. I need to make whoever did this pay. Back on Earth, two hours later, the president calls a press conference together, telling the world about how they have been finally saved from the threat of Garo by the Bureau of Sovereignty. The Conqueror is dead. He says, showing the press images of the massive starfish. He tells them that the plan was put into place by the head of the Bureau and motions her to the stage. Her days in the shadow are over. It's time for a grateful nation to thank you. To thank Amanda Waller. Waller gets behind the podium, thanking those that have gathered and informing them that it wasn't the Titans or the other heroes of Earth that have saved them from the being formerly known as Beast Boy. An image of Chester Runk with his son appears behind them. Chester Runk was the hero. 
Waller says giving them a story about how Chester Runk lost his son to the spores and decided to help defend the planet. We tried to extract him after his strike, but he was lost. He understood the risk, but I'm so sorry that we couldn't bring him home. Thanks to him, the Conqueror is down, Waller says. But more images appear behind her of the beasts attacking people throughout the world. Waller tells the press that the war isn't over, that the Bureau of Sovereignty will begin to corral the remaining beasts and use drones to eliminate them. A reporter raises his hand, pointing out that over a million people are still infected by the spores. Waller nods, trying to look sad, play the part. It was not an easy decision, Mr. Troop, but it is the right one, she says. The images change again and an American flag waves on the screen behind her. I know some of you will have family and friends amongst the infected. We are sorry for your loss, but the world thanks you for your sacrifice. She finishes. Meanwhile, back at Titan's Tower, the Titans are shocked by Waller's plan. But Raven is barely listening to the discussion and walks out of the room. Nightwing moves to follow her, but Donna stops him. Stay here. Work on the problem. I'll talk to her. Donna follows Raven outside and the two float over the roof of the tower. I could kill Waller. In minutes, I could be holding her heart in my hands, Raven says softly. She reaches for the jewel that sits against her forehead, explaining that the need, the want, is a part of her. All I need to do is release my demon side from the soul gem and join with her. Nothing will be able to stop me. Waller would be gone, she says, and Donna sits down, pointing out that no matter what, Gar wouldn't want that. He faced his own death, only thought of others. These people took my heart, but he wouldn't want me to harm them, she says with a sigh. Donna nods, putting her hand on her friend's shoulder. So now, instead of lashing out, I have to live up to the ideals of that selfless, beautiful, infuriating man, Raven says, and Donna smiles, pulling Raven in close for a hug. What an ass. Inside, Oracle calls the team together, showing them images of the Bureau as they begin to work at corralling all of the beasts. Some of the infected act out of fear, attacking the military, but they're quickly put down in a hail of gunfire. Cyborg looks to Nightwing, informing him that he can hack into the military systems and he can stop the drone strikes if they need to. You can single-handedly jack the systems of a major military power? That's a little concerning, Wally points out before turning to Nightwing. You do this and we won't be heroes in the eyes of many. We're going to be hated, Wally tells him. But Cyborg nods. At least a million more people will be alive to hate us. And Dick agrees. We have less than four hours to stop this. I won't take any option off the table. He asks if Vic can pinpoint the Bureau of Sovereignty's base. The first thing we're going to have to do is have a conversation. So one hour later, Raven teleports Nightwing and Flash to the secret base of the Bureau of Sovereignty. They peer over the hill, and at the guarded bunker, Nightwing asks Wally to take care of the guards. In a blur of red lightning, the guards suddenly disappear. Nightwing looks to his friends, asking Flash to stay outside just in case Waller won't listen to reason and Cyborg can't stop the drones, so that the speedster can try and protect as many of the infected from the strikes as possible. Next, he turns to Raven and asks her to wait outside, and she looks at him. You're worried I won't be able to control myself in front of Waller. She asks, but before anger can flash across her face, she admits that he is right. I won't abandon you to whatever lies in wait. I will be in your head if you need me. So a short time later, Waller is sitting at her desk, Peacemaker at her back, and Waller is taking a call from the president who isn't happy about not being kept in the loop on the drone strikes. But Waller points out that she doesn't need presidential approval for anything. Suddenly, Nightwing steps out of the shadows and Peacemaker whirls around, bringing his pistol up. Where the hell did you come from? He snaps, but Nightwing holds up his hands. I'm just here to talk. Nightwing glares at Peacemaker, ordering him to step aside. There's no need for violence. Peacemaker glances over his shoulder at Waller. Is there a need for some violence? He asks her. And Waller points out that Nightwing has broken into a government facility. Peacemaker takes that as a yes, opening fire. Nightwing easily dodges the first bullet, whirling in to knock the pistol from Peacemaker's hand, but Peacemaker smiles. Man, I've always wanted to beat that smug superiority off of you. He says as he launches in, punching Nightwing across the jaw, but Nightwing doesn't slow down, grabbing Peacemaker's helmet, whirling it around so that the government agent can't see. With this done, he kicks him hard and knocks him out. With the fight over, Nightwing turns back to Waller. 
I can see what you're doing, he tells her, pointing out that Waller is trying to turn the people of the world against the heroes so that she can have absolute power. Call off the strikes, we can save them all, Nightwing demands, but Waller just smiles slightly. That's when Nightwing realizes the truth. You don't want to save us. You don't want us to save them, he whispers, and he sighs, turning away, speaking into his comms, asking Cyborg to stop the strikes. It happens in moments, and Waller looks at her screen, getting confirmation. Cyborg hacked into every drone in the military's arsenal and turned it around. You left us no choice, Nightwing says to Waller's shocked face. She gets up and gets in his face. The Titans will not allow you to become a dictator, Waller. She just smiles with evil intent. The Titans just hijacked the military. Do you think people are going to accept that? If I'd known how recklessly stupid you'd act in response, I would have killed Garfield Logan years ago. But that's when she's rocked across the room by a blast of magic. Raven is there hitting Waller again and again. Do you have any idea how easy it would be to give in to my anger, to unleash the other part of me, to be as cruel and scared as you are? Raven bellows in rage. She reaches for the jewel and takes it to her, telling Waller that she doesn't want to use it because Gar would want her to stay in control. But the darkness begins to swirl around the room as a voice speaks out. Control? Look closer at what you hold in your hand. The voice calls out and Raven looks down to realize the gem that she thought contained her evil self is empty. You think you're in control, but there's no control here. There is only chaos, Dr. Hate says as they step out of the swirling darkness. Dr. Hate reaches up, pulling off the helm of chaos, revealing it to be Raven. You thought you deserved happiness, Rachel. Deserved love. You, who kept me imprisoned and slayed for so long. You deserve nothing but my hate, the evil Raven says with a vicious smile. Peacemaker finally awakens to find a dark world. I can't see anything, he shouts in fear, but realizes that his helmet is actually just backwards from the battle against Nightwing. Oh, he says as he fixes it, griping that superheroes are knocking everyone unconscious, and that there is plenty of research that shows that that causes post-traumatic brain injuries. But then he finally decides to look around and finds the black smoke swirling around the room as the two ravens are facing off against each other. What the hell is this? He whispers to Waller, who holds up a hand, ordering him not to move. Raven can't believe that her dark half is free. The demonic Raven pulls the Helmet of Chaos down, reminding Raven that she fought against a ruler of hell, one that warned her that a piece of her was actually missing. You didn't listen! You've been around these people for so long that you've convinced yourself that you're as insignificant as a human! And now I am free to be what we are always supposed to be! Dr. Hate says, raising her hand, preparing to attack. Raven throws up a shield, turning back to her friends. She warns Nightwing that she can't protect him and fight herself. I have to send you away! She calls out the Nightwing as she opens up a portal to suck him in. Save the infected! Don't send anyone to me! No one can help! She shouts as he disappears, with Dr. Hate launching forward, slamming into her. You're right! No one can save you! Nightwing drops back into the tower in front of a surprised Batgirl and Boa the Chimp. He quickly fills them in on the surprise turn of events. Walla, Bobo says, and Nightwing shakes his head with Bobo nodding, looking up at the hero. You said you had a plan that could work or make things much worse. Are you ready to share? The chimp asks and Nightwing nods. I need Superman. A short time later, John is standing before the cage that holds Wolf Batman. He looks at Nightwing, ordering him to open the cage, and the wolf leaps forward to attack. But John grabs a hold of him, putting a burst of electricity through the wolf's body. Sensing the more powerful hero, the spore leaps from Batman's mouth. Before John can destroy, an already transformed Bruce reaches out, grabbing it, slamming it into the ground. But Bruce is weak and collapses into Nightwing's arms. Did I hurt you? He gasps. Nightwing smiles, shaking his head. I'm fine. What's a light mauling between families? Bruce nods his head slowly. What's the plan? Nightwing quickly informs Bruce that they're going to bring back all of the infected, but they're going to need help. Food, shelter, reuniting the loved ones. Bruce nods again. I'll work with Oracle to coordinate aid agencies and street level heroes. Later, the strongest heroes on Earth are gathering at Titan's Tower, and Bobo details the plan. 
Waller has already begun corralling the beasts. The strongest heroes will act as bait and allow the spores to leave their hosts in attack. Allow the heroes to quickly destroy them. Cyborg looks at Barbara. I've just seriously overstepped and I've ticked off a lot of global military powers. What if they attack us on sight? That's a very valid concern, Barbara responds. And what Nightwing and Donna are working on as we speak. Back at the White House, the President looks up in surprise as Nightwing steps out of the shadows. Frightened, he demands to know what the young hero is doing. Please, don't be alarmed, Mr. President. I don't have time to go through the proper channels. He quickly explains that Amanda Waller has been using the whole situation as a grab for power, dehumanizing the infected to stoke the growing fears of the population. Yeah, but your people just hijacked the U.S. military. How do you expect me to trust you? President asks, and Nightwing agrees, reaching up for his mask. I understand my colleagues have done things differently in the past, but we need to trust one another. Nightwing says as he's about to reveal his identity, but the president stops him. He appreciates the gesture, but he knows the truth could be dangerous for the both of them. Their conversation is then interrupted when Dick gets word from Donna that the First Lady has been cured of the infection and is human once more. Thank you, the President says with a sigh of relief. Nightwing holds out a hand. We can do this for every one of the infected. No one else has to die, but we need to work together. The President shakes his hand and asks what he can do. Nightwing asks that the President contact the various world leaders and ask their militaries to stand down when the heroes arrive. We'll do the rest. Back over in Gotham, the Bureau hasn't gotten word yet. Sergeant Steel orders his men to open fire, but John is there before the tank rounds can hit the beast. He drops the round to the ground and turns on the beast, electricity sparking around his body as blue Superman powers begin to manifest. The spores leap for the stronger host, but are destroyed in the process. Back at the tower, Nightwing and Cyborg reveal power armor to Donna, something that is strong enough to fight against even an infected Kryptonian. You'll be impervious to the spores and living nightmare to the Kryptonians and the Tamaranians. In a metropolis, Superman and Supergirl are preparing to fight the transformed Power Girl, but Oracle comes over the radio ordering them to stand it down. We have the situation handled, she tells them. The Kryptonians watch in surprise as Power Girl is knocked clean out of the sky! Donna in her new armor stands over the hero, using her lasso to compel the spore to leave her body! Elsewhere in the world, Dr. Hate slams Raven into the ground, floating over her. There is no use struggling! Hate says as her dark magic is pinning Raven to the ground. The beasts close in on the magical woman. The spot of the creature that you loved will end you now! <laughs> Hate laughs at her, but the beasts, they don't attack. They merely stare at Raven, and that's when Dr. Hate realizes the truth. Could it be that part of Beast Boy's consciousness has spread across the spores? She ponders, but then she laughs, realizing that that means that with each spore killed, Raven's friends are actually killing the only part of Gar that remains. Across the world, the heroes are busy destroying the spores, until Raven's voice screams in their heads, Stop! Gar is in the spores! She shouts out, and all of the heroes suddenly look down in horror and realize that they have been slowly killing Beast Boy. At the tower, Nightwing gets on the comms, ordering everyone to lure and contain the spores only. Cyborg steps forward, powering up his boom tubes. Tell them all that I'm coming, and then evacuate the building. Vic says to Nightwing and Batgirl, Back in Metropolis, John is asking what he should do as a swarm of spores are chasing him. That's when a boom tube opens up and swallows them all up, sending them into Titan's Tower. Across the world, Cyborg is opening up boom tubes, sending all the remaining spores back to Titan's Tower. But back at the main fight, Raven looks at Dr. Hate, telling her evil side that she has failed. My friends are out there, saving everyone. Friends and family are being reunited. We're saving the people that Waller would have murdered, she says, but Dr. Hate flies forward, grabbing her by the throat. Oh, Rachel, it's still time for murder, she says. But Starfire is there hitting Dr. Hate with a blast of energy. Get off of her, she bellows as she slams into Hate, headbutting her hard. She reaches up, grabbing a hold of the Helm of Chaos and blasts it away. Dr. Hate roars in anger and pain, dark energy swirling around, grabbing a hold of the Temerian Princess. As acts of defiance go, that was a particularly worthless one. I will take my helmet back now, she says, but that's when Wally West is there, scooping it up before the dark smoke can even grab it. Yoink! 
he says with a smile as he begins to race away, the speed force cracking around him as he races with the helmet. He can hear the voices within ordering him to take the helmet, to sow chaos on the world. Yeah, <laughs> no thanks, he says as he stomps to the edge of a volcano, dropping the magical helmet inside. I've seen enough movies to know how this ends. Bye, Chaos Lords! He shouts as he runs away, their voices quickly fading as they melt away in the lava of the volcano. Back at the fight, Dr. Hate is roaring in anger, her face taking on a more demonic appearance as she prepares to rip Starfire apart. No, you will never harm my friends again! Raven shouts as she hits her twin with a blast of magic, opening up another portal, asking Starfire to leave. With the Lords of Chaos gone, I can take it from here. She tells her friend, but Starfire wants to fight beside her and defeat Dr. Haint. But Raven waves her through the portal. You already have, Cory. You've given me all I needed. A fair fight! She then whirls on her demonic side, holding up a gem that acted as the prison for the evil Raven. Whatever you hope to achieve, I'm the one in control here. And it is time for you to return to your containment, Raven shouts. But Dr. Haight rushes at her, dark magic swirling around as the two are locked in combat again. I will not be held again, Hate bellows. But alone, the two forms of Raven begin their final battle. Later, at Titan's Tower, the Titans have gathered outside. So because enough of Gar was in the spores, the beast didn't attack Raven? Cyborg asks, looking at Flash. Did he attack you? Wally nods, and they both agree that their feelings are hurt. Behind them, a portal opens and Raven returns, informing the team that her demonic side has been defeated. She is contained once more, she says as the gem glows on her forehead. Batgirl holds up a tablet, showing the team that the spores have begun to reform into the body of Gar. They're coming back together. Gar is back. Barbara says with a smile, but as the group floats up to the window to look inside, they see that while Gar's body is back, there wasn't enough of the spores to reform his mind. He stares at them blankly. He's not in there. I can feel glimpses of him, like half-recalled memories. Raven says, revealing quietly as she reads her love's mind. She floats back to the ground. Too much of him was destroyed. Elsewhere, it's the next morning that the reporters are gathering around Amanda Waller as she gives a prepared statement, informing the public that the heroes have gone too far, that all of this is because of their actions, that they have acted with impunity for far too long, and that the Bureau of Sovereignty will begin the process of taking back control of the planet. We start here by taking back a symbol, by taking back a suit of power. She says, motioning to the building behind them, the building that was once the Hall of Justice, this is now the Hall of Order, she declares, showing it taken over by the government. Back at the tower, the Titans mourn the loss of their friend, but Bobo has an idea and goes to Cyborg. May I have a word in private? It's about what I heard happened with Beast Boy and the Necrostar. It could be important. After a brief conversation, Cyborg goes to the rest of the group, telling them that they may have an idea. He looks to Raven and he asks her to bring Gar to the Sahara Desert. We're gonna need space, and we're gonna need heat. He looks at the Kryptonians, Donna and Cory, telling them that he needs them in space. A short time later, a boom tube opens up and the powerful heroes gently lower a frozen tentacle that had fallen off a Garo when he attacked. As the heroes lower the massive tentacle to the earth, Wally looks up in shock. What the hell, Cyborg? And that's when the heroes get to work defrosting the massive appendage. Bobo steps up to Nightwing. I was thinking, sea stars can regenerate from a single arm, but are the only known creature to regenerate neurons. The chimp says quietly. Next, Donna steps up and wraps her lasso around the massive tentacle, willing whatever remains of Gar to return to his human form. The heroes watch as the tentacle begins to reform with its host body, becoming one with the mindless form of Gar. He screams in pain, collapsing to the ground. But when he opens his eyes, he smiles at Raven. Ray? What happened? He asks softly. She smiles, tears in her eyes, as she rushes to Gar. You did it, she tells him softly. The heroes gather around their friend alive once more. We won, Raven tells the man that she loves. But darkness surrounds the gem, and a voice calls out weakly. It asks her friends for help, hoping that someone, anyone, can hear her. But they can't. The demonic form of Raven smiles as she holds up the gem that contains the good form of Raven. The one who lost the final battle. Shh, I'm the only one that can hear you. Your friends don't even know that you're gone, Rachel. The demon smiles with an evil smile. But they'll know soon. 
And there you have it, the Titans Beast World. Now with the other big events, you are currently caught up on the Dawn of DC, but don't forget to like and subscribe as more videos featured in the world of comic books will be coming up here very soon.